Alright, so I'm going to be starting a Victoria 2 Let's Play. Uh, I came to the conclusion that I wanted to do one after playing quite a lot with Joe, and this is just going to be a single player Let's Play. It's probably going to be pretty quick, because I'm going to be able to go at the faster speeds as opposed to the normal multiplayer games that I end up doing that only go at speed 2 or 3. And what kind of country should I play? Hmm? Well, as you can see up here, this is what I've been playing with Joe. I've been playing as China, he's been playing as Japan. Yep. And that has made me want to play as Japan. Now, they're a unique country for a couple of reasons. They, first off, are uncivilized. That means that you have to do a couple of reforms to be able to make factories and get capitalists and really advance in technology. And another reason that they're unique is because of the Maiji Restoration, which is an event or decision, not really sure, haven't played them in a long time, event or decision that basically speeds up how many research points you get, or lowers the cap, whatever it is, makes you industrialize faster. And I think it also increases the amount of rebels you would get. So either way, they're interesting to play as, and I'm going to be... Just for this Let's Play, I'm going to be explaining, uh, by popular request, explaining what is going on when I'm playing. Just because I'd like to think I, I know how the game works. Uh, I, I know how to play the game. So, I'm going to be explaining just what I'm doing, uh, why, etc. Alright. So, let's go and look here at the MyG Restoration. We have early... Or we just have my restoration. Uh, okay. So basically, I can either just do it straight up, or wait till someone puts me in their sphere of influence, which I cannot really meddle with because I'm not a great power, which can't be until you're industrialized. And so if I select this, I'll get some research points. I'll have a land reform. I'll have one of these reforms, land reform that and a lot of people be pissed off but I'll be getting 30% more research points it's it's worth it absolutely it's important that you industrialize as soon as possible as a nation like this now I'm gonna be selecting my national focus uh, I'm I really want to choose the most populous place for it to have the biggest impact so this place is only a couple provinces. Oh, this one's definitely the biggest. Yeah, the Kansai region. Now, since I can't choose capitalists or craftsmen as I would normally choose, I'm going to be choosing clergymen, because clergymen help improve your literacy rate. And your literacy contributes to how many research points you're getting. So, I want more clergymen, so both of these will go up. Makes me get more technology in the long run, and it's best to start this kind of investment early in the game. Now here, taxes, since I'm not industrialized, they don't really matter. Whatever works, works. I don't really have to entice people to be capitalists or can make them so poor that they become craftsmen. Doesn't really need to do anything like that. Military spending, I think for a nation with such a small population, take note I was playing as China before, uh, with small population such as Japan, you probably are going to need to have this military spending a little higher than I would normally keep it. I like to keep it pretty low just because I feel like it's a waste. But, you know, we'll see how my budget goes after a couple days. Tariffs. Uh, I suppose, once again, since I'm not industrialized, I don't need to have factories be a thing. Uh, I could keep these pretty high. Also this, not at war with anyone, doesn't really matter, but it's so cheap because I'm not industrialized once again. Uh, education all the way up, administration all the way up. I'm going to want both of those to be as high as possible because, especially this administrative map mode. See here we've got only 28.9 efficiency, 37, all that is pretty bad. What that affects is how effective I am at collecting taxes. Well, at least maybe not that, but... What it does affect is just like general efficiency, such as uh, how many tariffs I'm getting. See there, it says effective tariffs, 31.3%. That's going to be higher if my efficiency is 
is higher as well. So it's just my ability to properly run the government. So I want these administrative efficiencies to go up as high as possible by increasing this slider here. Can't really do anything technology wise because you know I'm uncivilized. And so uh, I think we're just ready to you know start playing. These militaries are well samurai still. And you know what Joe did in our game, I'll just get this going. And then balance out the budget. It should balance itself. There we are. Okay, so what Joe did in our game was he instantly invaded Korea. Now, you know, I'm not really sure if this was even a good idea, because in the long run it hurt his literacy. Just caused a lot of revolts. And it only just supplied him with these really the most valuable things really are these coal provinces which I suppose is useful once you industrialize I'm just not sure whether it was worth it um, I know historically Japan did invade Korea so I think I might be doing that as well maybe not just quite yet alright so See here, we are getting 4.19 research points, 4.2 now, daily. And that, every day, we're going to be getting more, and it'll just be adding that to right here. And some of these reforms are quite expensive. This one's only 7,000, whereas this one is 17,000. But they also add a civilization progress, which, if we look at this map mode here, you can see I'm at 10%. Most other nations are at zero. Just because I had the Mighty Restoration, it gave me a reform, which put me at 10. Once you get to 100, uh, this button down here is on a lit up. You're able to click it, and you become a normal Western nation. It'll also give you, I believe, the first tier of technologies, or at least one past what you already have, because some of the reforms give you one of them, like this one, which one of the reforms, I believe, gives you this, so you get that. You know, that kind of stuff. And so, my first reform I think I'm going to be getting is probably education reform. And this is going to help me get my literacy up faster. That education efficiency plus 20 would be really useful because then I'll be able to get my literacy up faster, which will help me with research points in the long run. And wow, this is actually going up pretty quickly. My literacy rate's not going up that fast, but that's probably due to the fact that I don't really have that many clergymen. And also, I don't really have any of these technologies right here that give you any education efficiency. So that's probably why that is. Oh, wow. Yeah. Hmm. Really expensive. Well, I'm either going to need to get that education reform... Or the administrative reform. Maybe even the financial reform. Just because I'm not able to get enough money out of these people to afford my education. Yeah, I'm going to put it down to, say, 95. This will go to about 90. At least then I'll have enough money to consistently not go under. Because as an uncivilized nation, without this reform, you cannot take any debt. So if you are at the end of the month, not month I suppose, but day, at the end of the day, if you have no money, or at least not enough to pay all this kind of stuff, it simply just won't pay it. You won't go negative like an industrialized nation, but you won't be paying your teachers or bureaucrats. So not, not good. No. Uh, so this defense, are we having more people sign up for soldiers, or are they leaving? More people are signing up. Okay. So that means that, since I do want that to be a thing, I'm just going to be leaving this where it is, because that's enough for more people to sign up. Uh, so... I don't need to raise it or lower it. It's doing exactly what I want for a decent price. Uh, we almost have enough for this education reform. It's only uh, about 
excuse me, about a thousand more research points, which should take mm, better part of what about half a year, a little more than half a year probably. Ooh, gold. It was there, I believe. Yeah, sixteen. Okay. Now another cool thing about this game is immigration. You don't really see it, at least quite yet. Ooh, what happened? Why am I making so much money? That? Hmm. I don't know. You don't really see immigration until you're industrialized. Obviously, you see just a little bit here because people are moving to this gold rush, gold rush province. You don't see immigration quite yet. But later in the game, what you'll see is all of Europe in the immigration map mode is going to be red. They're all going to be immigrating to the United States, Brazil, those kind of nations. Canada, when that's a thing. And that's going to be due to the multiple bonuses the United States gets from Manifest Destiny to uh, the... Hmm, what's it called? The Homestead Act. Yeah. Uh, multiple things like that. Also the fact that USA is a democracy. All that kind of stuff entices people to move to the United States. So much so that despite them having 4 million now, by the end of the game they'll probably have more than 20 million. And that's not going to be from natural population growth. Okay, so if you look here, this here is our militancy. This is how much people want to revolt. And right now it's going down, which is good. It was a bit high from the Maiji Restoration. And we don't really want it to stay, I'd say, higher than 3 or 2. Because otherwise, uh, revolts or rebels are going to be organizing. Okay, we almost got our education reform here. Let's just do that real quick. Which is going to kick up our militancy. Watch that. Three. As soon as I click on that. Yeah. Now we're at four. But. Now this is. Wow. Look at that. Before we were going up by 0.01 something. Now we're on the better half of 0.2. So almost at 0 0.3. 0 0.03. Which is really good. That's going to help our literacy get up really high. We start with a pretty high literacy for an uncivilized nation too. Uh, I mean, Austria starts with less than that. Austria starts with, I believe, 19, which is abysmal compared to an uncivilized nation like Japan. I guess it just goes to show, not really uncivilized, they just don't have the same technology as you. Anyway, uh, I think I might make a war justification, justification for Korea. If anything, I suppose I could... Mm, can't make him a puppet. So I suppose Conquest is just going to have to do. But I don't think I should do that quite yet. Maybe after I get uh, some other reforms, such as uh, foreign weapons, then I'll have such an advantage and the ability to make normal units, but such an advantage over Korea that it won't really be an issue. I suppose first what I can do now is just make a bigger navy. So I'll do that. So let's set us a rally point down here. Best feature of... Uh, I believe it was a house divided that added this in. Best feature is this in my opinion. It's something so simple but it makes organizing armies so easy. So let's make us... Uh, mm, well, actually, Clipper Transport's value of 1, we can support up to 16. But I don't think we're going to have that many. Let's just make 9. Okay. Now, once those are all done building, which we can see their progress right here, they'll automatically all go to Kyoto, and they should form into one fleet. Now, I imagine since we're uncivilized, we're going to have trouble getting the resources needed to make this. Which is a bit disappointing. But it's just going to have to be how it is. Now let's see. Look at that. Wow. Uh, look at this administrative map mode. Our efficiency has already skyrocketed. Just because we're focusing so much on this right here. And that's probably the reason why we're making so much more money now. Because this was only making like 90 before, and now it's making 270, 290, almost 300. So, that's in 
really impressive and is really helping us out on the economy front. Maybe not the economy, but the budget. As for saw, we got almost 140, almost 150k. Okay, so we just had an event pop up that was the coronation of Queen Victoria. What that does, I've played Prussia enough times to know this. Uh, what this does is it kicks the United Kingdom, uh, it kicks the Hanover out of the sphere of the United Kingdom and makes them, like, opposed, right? Which basically opens up Prussia to put them in their sphere, which will allow them sooner or later to become the North German Federation. <coughs> All right, so we have a crisis as well. Lots going on. Uh, it's over the United States and the United Kingdom, both wanting British Columbia, which is region right here. Both of them want it. Uh, United Kingdom has a bit of an advantage, not to mention they're a more powerful power at this time. I imagine they're going to be the ones getting it. Luckily enough, the United States isn't fighting over Washington and Oregon in the, the series... Or not series, but game that Joe and I were playing. Uh, well, the United States never got these. Britain took Washington, Oregon, and California. It was pretty weird. You saw Canada with the West Coast. And as a result, the United States didn't have the gold rush and a lot of other stuff to improve or to entice more immigrants to move to them. And so they didn't really ever become as powerful as they could have been. Just because of some crises over, uh, I think there was a crisis over Washington. Although here, yeah, look at that. United Kingdom has most of the major powers backing them. Even if these two supported the United States, these guys would probably win. Just in a land battle, I believe Prussia, Austria, and Russia would demolish France and Spain. Okay. Alright, United States. There you go. Didn't think you had a chance. So, the UK now has it. One thing I don't like about this expansion pack so much is that the AI seems really keen to making puppets. Like, the UK loves spitting out Colombia. Even though they're probably going to make Canada sometimes down the line, it'll look really weird. They just love making Colombia. Now, if we look at Australia and stuff, have they... Sp yeah, they've spit out Australia already. And New Zealand, yes. So, it'll look really, really weird when they start colonizing the inner Australia. It'll be green with an inner shell of red. It looks really dumb. They should make it so the AI doesn't spit out those kind of nations until, say, 1890, when all colonization is done. That would be ideal. It would just make the map look the best. Alright, so our fleet here is done. We've got 10 clipper transports, which have been built all around the nation, and due to our our rally point here in Kyoto they've all assembled right here and now this rally point here since since we have a fleet of 10 uh, it can carry 10 weight what that means it's able to carry 10 regiments so we only have red divisions or armies of three regiments so we really could say group up all these three put them in Kyoto probably should do that with the other ones as well put them in Kobe we could group them all up, and they'll all be able to get in the fleet at once, which is pretty useful, because then you don't need to ferry over armies like you would have otherwise. And the way that armies work in this game, uh, I won't be going into that too much right now, just because we don't really have much choice in terms of army. Maybe once I'm actually building an army. But right now... Um... We are on par with Korea. We don't have any advantages, disadvantages, because we don't have any other reforms. And I doubt they do. Yeah, they don't. So, this war... Do we outnumber them? Let's let's take a look. If you click on them, go to go to Diplomacy, and you go to the shore, Show Wars, they have 13 brigades, which means they have 39,000 men, while we have 18 brigades. Which means that we have, what is that, 24 plus 30, 54,000 men. Not significantly more, which is probably something we should fix. So, let's get on that. Oh, look, we can make cavalry. Awesome. They're a little better at attack, but a little worse at defense. Well, we're going to be mostly attacking, so it'll be alright. 
let's just make say 10 of these 5 of these and that probably will be good actually let's just okay that's not what I wanted at all yeah that was an accident okay one two and then one more just so we'll have two even armies oh look at that a couple have already finished yeah these irregulars are the weakest units but they're also incredibly easy and easy to make and maintain because we have an army and if you look at the clipper convoys that's what's costing us by far the most yeah, land units are costing us 1.5 pounds. Which, this game is in pounds because at the time, England was by far the most powerful power. Powerful power, I really need to stop saying that. It sounds really janky, doesn't it? England was the number one great power, so it only makes sense. Alright, that's one more army done. And I'm going to be able to get the or form here, which gives us guns. Prob probably should have waited to make an army before then, but that's also one of the reasons why I saved nine, uh, nine like units to be infantry. Because they are significantly better than even our cavalry. But they also cost more, and I'm only going to be making a few of them for now. Yeah, this army is pretty unbalanced. It's going to be really heavy on cavalry. Just because it builds them in the order that you click on them. And I clicked on them all infantry first. So, yeah, whatever. We'll deal with it. Doesn't really need to be too efficient here. Because, well, Korea's still got a pretty small army. Alright. Now we can get our another reform. Going to piss off a little people a bit more. Imported weapons, which has given us a technology. It has given us flintlock rifles, which allows us to construct infantry. Which are these. Ta-da, right? And as you can notice here, estimated cost of goods not in stockpile. 90, 100 pounds, around there. Infantry, 8,000. Bit of a difference. And frankly, I don't even think we need them for this invasion. So I'm not going to be making them. I'm going to add them to my army a little later on. Just because the rebels will be useful to deal with. Oh, oof. Look at that. Nice. We got an invention, which is enabled by technologies such as this. And it has made a regular attack better. Cool. Same as cavalry. So now we do have a significant advantage over Korea. And now if we look here, we can see rebel factions are organizing in our country. Yeah, they've got quite a few guys ready to rise up. And the revolt risk is only going up. Yeah, that's not really good at all. Um, so after this irregular, this last irregular that's being built in Kyoto here is done... I'm probably going to make those infantry units, just because we're probably going to need to fight off a revolution. Yeah, that's what it's looking like. This is only going up, and they would have over 90,000 men join. Which I'm not too keen on having happen. So, let's make our infantry. The law will gather in Tokyo, or Edo it was, as it was called back then. And they're probably going to take a lot longer to make just because we don't have all the small arms and canned food for them. Which, if we look here... Okay, they're not in high demand, so... Oh, but canned food is in high demand. Significantly as well. Now, I don't like to buy stuff manually. It's a pain... Uh, I suppose if you're playing as a really small nation, say for whatever reason, if you want to play as a small Indian nation, 
Uh, you could buy stuff manually and do it pretty effectively. Probably be more efficient. But, you know, I'm playing as Japan. They're not that small. Uh, if we look at our production thing here, nothing. Obviously, we don't have any... Don't have any factories because we're not industrialized. Alright, see so what's our administrative map would look like. Okay, awesome. That this is almost perfect, other than this region here. Just this is just due to the fact that since we've been encouraging clergymen, we haven't been getting so many other types of people. Like we haven't been getting as many bureaucrats as over here. If we look here and go to uh right here. Alright, we'll just pause that real quick. We've got 0 .058 bureaucrats there. But in here, we have only 0 .016. Or 0 .16, wow. Alright. Bit of a revolt. Nothing we can't deal with. Alright, one guy up there. Let's just slow this down just a bit. I always like to slow it down just a bit for revolutions so they don't get the chance to siege stuff by me being inefficient. Alright, so they're almost dealt with. Excellent. Where are they going? Tokushima. And they're going down there. Let's chase them. You go there. You meet up in Tokushima. Because it'll be much easier to just sail the men over because that's faster. Okay, so we're losing here. If we look at the battle thing. Uh, it's because we don't... When we do have a general, he's just really shit. And we're also at the terrain disadvantage, which is probably what you're remembering from Europa. As well as CK2. And Hearts of Iron. Hmm. Well, I suppose all the Paradox games have it. Chase him down to Osaka. Alright, we lost that battle. But you guys, after you deal with that, come down here and deal with that. That's using the shift key. Alright, so you guys are going to demolish that army. Now this fleet, let's actually make them go... Oh, go away. Right there. <clears throat> then I'll sail my guys over, land in Miyazaki, and take control of this island once again. Uh, let's actually use both of these armies to just deal with these rebels, because they've, they've already caused us enough trouble. Yeah, in the end, this isn't really that too that threatening of a revolution. Later in the game, when you get communists and that kind of stuff, those revolutions look a bit more scary because they end up having hundreds of thousands of men and they're trained, as opposed to these guys. Yeah, look at that—they're actually doing significant damage to my men. Do they have a good general or something? Yeah, morale plus 23. Alright, chase him down. You don't really need any more, so just go into Kyoto. Okay, so we're almost done with this. Meanwhile, let's look at our reforms. Kick that up. Alright, let's finish our reforms here. I think next, since I've already gotten imported weapons, I think I'm going to be saving up and going for industrial progress because it'll give us water wheel power. Now what water wheel power does is if we can look here, makes us have a farming output of 15% more as well as a mining output of 5% more. That is really good. That is going to be really good for our economy and also while well, the chance of getting this invention which is also very good. Oh look at that. One rebel escaped us. Yeah, he's dead. Okay. So that's dealt with up in the north. And that's the last of the revolts. Awesome. Okay, so let's get to invading Korea. Hopefully there's no one's fear yet. Yep, no one's really even tried. I suppose looks like Spain's trying. Anyway, let's conquest them. Now, as long as our infamy doesn't go above 25, that's the always that's always the infamy limit. 
Whereas in Europa, it changes. Here, it's just 25. Just don't go above it. Otherwise, all nations in the world will get, or at least the great powers, uh, will get a cut down to size case of belly on you. Which basically means give us all your money and get rid of your army, which is not something I want to do. So this invasion force is probably going to be plenty. Not to mention we have this more professional army being built over here, or modern. So once we have our war justification, which we can see the progress of right here, we'll be able to declare war on Korea. Now it looks like that our war justification uh, generation is increased by 80% due to us being an uncivilized nation. I wonder if it actually goes up more or less when you become industrialized. We'll see. Alright, still only 4,000 research points. Look at that, even more. That's a good event. So, what kind of reforms can we get later on? So, as I said, industrial progress is probably what we're going to do. After that, I might go for some of the indust or the military technologies or reforms, just because they give you 15% civilization progress as opposed to 10 here, 10 here. I'd like to become civilized as soon as possible, and that's probably the best way to do it, those kind of reforms. All right, now I'm going to take bureaucrats, or I'm going to make bureaucrats the focus here because we've got plenty of clergymen. Actually, no. Let's just move the focus of clergymen over here. So that way we can get our administrative efficiency up right here, and we'll also get more clergymen over in the capital. Alright, let's just speed this up here until we get our cases belly. After I invade Korea, we'll call this little session a quits. And this has been actually pretty good. Good start for Japan. Awesome. Alright, so we've got our cases belly against Korea. Let's do the invasion, shall we? Declare war. Conquest. 85 is the war score we're going to need. Now, war score is done a bit differently in this game. It's most similar to to uh, Europe and Universal's 3, but there's one big difference. Everyone contributes to the war score, and... Uh, and it doesn't matter who takes a province if you want it. All that matters is what you declared war for and what your current war goals are. See here, if I had added, say, uh, take this region, it doesn't really matter if one of my allies had sieged all those regions because all that they would do is just contribute to the war score, which would help me out. Which is pretty nice that you can actually determine who gets what, basically. All right. So it looks like we only see one of the Korean armies in Seoul. I'm sure that they've got more in the north. Looks like they're making men. Uh, they still haven't gotten any reforms, so they don't have guns, which is good. Wow, we've already taken a place. Uh, do we have a good general here? Yes, we do. So let's march on the army in Seoul, which they'll promptly leave. Or I suppose if we go there now, now they're not going to be able to run away. Perfect. And that's planes. Okay, come on. We should win this battle. We've got the better men and the better general. Wow, crush the army. Perfect. Looks like this invasion is not going to be too hard. Invading Korea a bit early. I believe Japan actually did it in the late 1800s or early 1900s. Not too sure on that. Yeah, they're probably going to try to re-siege Wanzhou. Ooh, there's their fleet. Four ships. Versus R-10. Wow, look at this naval system. That's pretty cool. Huh. I know they redid it in the latest expansion, Back Heart of Darkness. 
but I haven't had the chance to look at it too much because as China I was obviously focusing on military uh, on the land front as you can see they've got more than a million men it's just this number times 3,000 so as you can see the land is a little bit more important for China all right let's just take the capital which will contribute to our war score more than any of the other provinces we'll probably speed up this war a bit just because we're just sieging stuff right get you on the ship land you in Kangnun or Gangnam <laughs> Korea no that's right there south suburbs of Seoul I suppose it's a part of Seoul, isn't it? Yeah. That's my explanation from a Korean friend, at least. And one thing I'm not going to be doing is destroying all of the history of Korea, which I've heard plenty about from my Korean friends when the Japanese invaded. Uh, they kind of, like, burned all the history and stuff. They're, they're still not too happy about that, which is understandable. So, one thing this is going to do is going to lower my literacy rate. Just because the people here in Korea probably have a lower literacy rate than me. Because Japan is pretty unique in the fact that they've got a high literacy rate. So, it's probably going to hurt our uh, literacy a bit. Which is, eh. We'll see how it actually hurts our research points. Almost taking Korea. Almost done here. See, I think what really led me to want to invade is just these northern provinces. The coal and iron are going to be really useful. Not to mention, if I invade them now as opposed to later, they will actually be a, a state in my country rather than a, a colony if I were to take them in the future. Because I would probably industrialize before them. And if I'm industrialized and they are not and I invade them... Uh, and like say established protectorate as my war goal they would they would become a colony as opposed to a state which means I can't build factories or if I can it's just not the same if I recall correctly uh, so I just prefer to have them now as opposed to when I'm already industrialized almost done with this war probably just need to wait till that's done might as well send one of the guys home And just leave, I'd say, two armies in here. Just because there's probably going to be more revolts because I conquered them. Yeah, alright, there we go. Rejected! Oh, come on. Alright, we're just going to have to take every province, which is done about now. They're going to offer it to us. Annex Korea, sure. Look at that. Japan. Alright, our literacy rate did just drop. And I can't remember whether our research points dropped. Hmm. Can't remember, to be honest. Uh, one thing I'm going to be doing is encouraging bureaucrats, because they're going to need more administrative efficiency. Alright, so let's get this navy over here. And as soon as I take this army back, I'm going to call it quits for this session, because I have to do other stuff today. Shockingly, right? So let's take them, take them to Hokkaido. Yep, Hokkaido. Alright. I'll move the fleet to Kyoto then. And thank you guys for watching. And I'll see you guys next time.